But I'll, I'll read you a passage out of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse number 1. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 1. Thank you to everyone who had a hand in the kindness. I've pastored a church for many years, and so I know there's all kinds of folks that do stuff that, that don't ever get to come up here and get a bouquet for it. Somebody cleaned that beautiful room I stayed in. Somebody put all kinds of snacks and stuff in there. and Just everybody's been so kind to me, and I thank you for that. 2 Corinthians 4 and 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, anybody been a recipient of mercy? Yeah, well then don't faint. That's what he said. Don't quit. We faint not. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, he says. Paul says, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Sad words here in verse four, or verse three, but if our gospel be hid, mm, it's hid to them that are lost. That's sobering. In whom, he says, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them for we preach not ourselves paul says but christ jesus the lord and ourselves your servants for jesus sake for god who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of god in the face of jesus christ verse seven but we have this treasure <laughs> in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. My message title today is this. You're a vessel, not a vault. You're a vessel, not a vault. And you can be seated if you'll smile. If you're going to be a grump, just remain standing because we'd like to spot you. <laughs> There's a few of you that just lied right then, but we'll, we'll have altar time after a while. They are some of the heaviest and most secure structures built by man. Can you give me the next slide, please? We call them vaults. Next slide. There we go. We call them vaults. Literally hundreds of tons of steel and concrete that exist for one reason. The value of what's on the other side of those doors. Next slide. Consider with me, if you would, that in New York, <laughs> do y'all feel that? Just blocks from Wall Street sits this vault with 25% of the world's known gold reserves in it. 540,000 bars of gold sit behind a 90 ton steel door in a vault that is 80 feet underground cut out of bedrock. Why? Because there's some $270 billion worth of gold housed there. The unfortunate thing is that 98% of it is foreign owned. But of course, part of the reason for that is this next slide, because ours is here. Fort Knox, Kentucky. Fort Knox, the facility there that holds the U.S. gold reserves is surrounded by four fences two of which are electrified. The building is made of granite walls that are four feet thick, held together with some 750 tons of reinforcing steel. There are armed sentinels that walk the perimeter of that building 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Inside, there is a 22-ton vault door. Surrounding this building are, of course, the some 30,000 soldiers that are stationed on that base. If somehow you made it past the 30,000 soldiers and got past the armed marching sentinels and got through the four feet thick granite walls and made your way down inside to the 22-ton vault door, you would have to bring with you a number of people, each of whom only knows part of the combination. There's no living human that knows the entire combination to open that vault. Why? Because the bulk of our nation's gold reserves are held there. And while we no longer particularly have a gold standard for our currency, still, it is said, they will not tell you how much gold is there. They will only state that it is of roughly 3% of all the gold that has ever been refined in human history. But it's not just about money. Next slide, if you would. Travel with me. 
to a place called Cheyenne Mountain, Wyoming, meant to be the military command headquarters in the event of an all-out nuclear conflict, home of something that the military calls NORAD, the North American Aerospace Defense Command. The men and women who work there do so behind two of these doors, each of which is a 25-ton blast door. This has been engineered to withstand. you got to get your mind around this. That door has been engineered to withstand the direct hit of a 30-megaton nuclear weapon. To put that into perspective, the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima at the end of World War II would have to be 1,429 times bigger to get through that door. The site is buried under 2,000 feet of mountain granite. The air has to be piped in. It is considered the purest in the world, having been processed for chemical, biological, and nuclear contaminants. Why? Because our command and control structures for the military are there. Key defense personnel and systems operate from there, and they must be kept safe. You do understand that that is what a vault does. It is designed in consideration of the value of what is kept inside. Now, you can think this next part is just preacher talk if you want, but you'll save me some time if you act like you agree with it. I want to remind you of something today, that all the gold in Fort Knox and all the gold of the New York Federal Reserve Bank put it together, and it does not equal the value of the treasure that is inside your soul. said if you've had your sins washed away in the blood of Calvary if you've been filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost you have a treasure that's greater than anything this world knows about every Holy Ghost filled believer in this house has placed inside of you greater riches than anything this world has ever seen I don't care you can talk about Elon Musk and you can talk about whomever and the billionaires in the world and how vast their wealth is and I tell you you show me a crack addict that comes up out of the water dripping wet talking in tongues and his addiction has been broken that man that man has a wealth that this world can't touch because when Elon Musk and Twitter have all burned up, what was born in that man is going to live on through eternity. I tell you, you have a treasure. Uh, you want to know what that treasure looks like? Colossians 1 and 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You want to know what kind of treasure I've got? I've got Christ in me. When I'm going through my darkest night, I've got Christ in me. When I'm driving down the highway, I've got Christ in me. When hell is trying to beat me up, I've got Christ in me. When I step on my job, I've got Christ in me. And, and that's better than gold. And that's better than silver. And that's better than rubies. And that's better than diamonds. And it's better than anything this world has ever known. Our, our, text, our text calls it a treasure. It has value. It has worth. It cannot be replaced. If you lose this, there's no substitute for it. I would like to remind somebody here today of how profoundly blessed you are. I don't know who's going through the toughest season of life right now, and it comes to everyone. Doesn't mean you've done anything wrong. It just happens. Life happens to people. And I don't know who's going through the hardest medical diagnosis or whose family is in the most chaos or whose job is the most uncertain or whose finances are in the biggest pickle. But this is what I can tell you. No matter what you're going through, you still have a treasure. And that's why shouldn't nobody have to beg us to praise God when we come in this place? Shouldn't anybody have to prime us and plead with us? Come on, somebody, give God praise. Nobody ought to have to do that. I walked in this house today with a treasure. I walked in this house today with a treasure. Woo. 
Oh my. Jesus Christ lives in you. Well, folks, a treasure has to be guarded. Certain steps are taken when you understand the value of a treasure. And you do this naturally. You do it intuitively. You might leave an old muddy pair of boots on your front porch. You're not leaving the keys to your new car. Why? Because one has more value to you than the other. The manner in which you treat something tells me how much you value it. Yeah, you're walking out of here today and you're walking out to your car and reach in for your keys out and drag a penny out of your pocket and your penny rolls as it will do under your car to the exact geographic center of your car and then it will lay down. I don't think there's very many of you going to face plant on the pavement stretching, reaching underneath your greasy, dirty car to try to get that penny. If you do, we will take up an offering for you because you're hurting. Okay. If, on the other hand, you pull your keys out of your pocket and a hundred dollar bill flutters out, you know what that means? That means you got on somebody else's britches. But anyway, hundred dollar bill flutters out and the wind blows that thing under and it stops right in the middle underneath your car. I don't care how nice your clothes are. You ain't driving off and going, oh well. If you are, I want to follow you to your car today, just on the off chance. I mean, you're going, you're going to go down and reach and stretch. Well, unless you've got a teenager and then you'll have them do it. But you're going to reach and stretch. And, and if somebody makes fun of you, man, what are you doing? You're in your good clothes. You would say, you don't understand what that's worth to me. That's why I maintain when people try to mock us for how we live and the way we reach after God and the way we stretch ourselves and what we do, the only reason you don't understand why I live like I live is you've never tasted the value of what I found. Hey, if you ever talked in tongues one time and felt the joy of the Holy Ghost, you'd understand why I say I'll do anything, I'll go anywhere, I'll hey, because it's so valuable to me. There's to keep that in my hands. Let me, let, me, let me try another example. For many years, I had a safe deposit box in the bank. Paid 90 bucks a year to have that thing in there. And I, and I kept a few things in it. A few, you know, passports and life insurance policies, stock certificates, a few things we had. I've never in my life thought about walking in that bank Tell that lady in the front, I need to get my safe deposit box, please, carrying my Piggly Wiggly bag. And she said, well, sure, you need a private room or you... Oh, no, I just got a few things I'm going to throw in there. Open that thing up, reach in that bag, pull out a burnout light bulb, broken shoestring, and a spatula we melted on the stove. Sir, what are you doing? I'm going to put these things. They're going to get me medical attention. Because it don't make any sense. You don't go to that length for something that has no value. If, on the other hand, I had my Piggly Wiggly bag, and uh, she said, well, well you, got, you got something put in her? Yeah, I've got these original Google stock certificates. Let's pause for a moment of silent reverence, shall we? She's going to say, man, all she's going to wonder, she's not going to laugh at my commitment to get it, make it safe. She's only going to wonder why I didn't do it sooner. And that's all I'm telling you when somebody wants to mock you for the steps you go to keep this treasure safe. That's not really the question. The question is, if you understand the value, why wouldn't you do it sooner? I appreciate you young people just a minute. Don't you let your friends make fun of you because you dress modest and act godly. You just got to say, man, if you knew the treasure that... I don't understand, sir, why you lead your family like that. I've got a treasure. I don't understand why you dress godly. I've got a treasure. I don't understand why you don't go certain places. Let me explain it to you. I have a treasure. <laughs> However I need to live. Anybody agree with me today? Yeah. However I need to live. However I need to act. However I need 
need to dress, however I need to appear, whatever I need to avoid, nothing is too much care when it comes to protecting and guarding this treasure. So, this treasure is to be guarded. Let me explain to you how this works. I say something brilliant. You say amen. I've never said anything brilliant, but anyway. So this treasure has to be guarded. But it is not to be hoarded. It is amazing to understand with the incredible value of this treasure where God placed it. He did not put it behind strong reinforced doors never to be seen again. The writer said, next slide if you would please, that he chose to invest his treasure in earthen vessels. As you read through the scriptures, you'll find vessels of varying worth. You'll find vessels of gold, of silver, of fine copper, You'll read about vessels of ivory, of brass, of iron, precious wood, even stone. But all those things are durable materials. They will last. Generations can pass with these vessels remaining. But God put his treasure inside vessels of earth. Simple, fragile items made by the potter. Potter's vessels that can be so easily broken They can be marred They're not very pretty They are imperfect They are not durable In fact, they're rather cheap If you break one, you just go get another one It's not that big a deal now, I know we don't use them today Instead, we have these this, I try to come up with a representation I doubt if any of you got up this morning and ate your Cheerios out of something made by a potter. This is what we have. Simple, cheap, common, ordinary, just simple styrofoam cups. Next slide. Yeah, we, we have a treasure, but it's just in styrofoam cups. 2 Corinthians 4, 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and it's not of us. Nobody's terribly impressed by that. I didn't feel too bad asking for it this morning. What like I was asked for the crown jewels? Buy 10,000 of them at Costco, $12.95. Rent a flatbed trailer, bring them home on, you know. I mean, let me try to put it this way. Maybe I can make this make sense like this. If you came to my home, next slide, and my wife served you tea in this, I have no question you, that you would comment on the elegance of the serving. Well, the ladies would. If you guys start doing this, I'd probably throw you out. But I know what you ladies would do. Oh, it's lovely. Has it been in your family long? Did it belong to your grandmother? What pattern is that? How, how many place settings do you have? If on the other hand, we served you tea in this, next slide. Ain't nobody going, oh. Has it been in your family long? How many place settings do you have? 10,000, we just got back from Costco. It, <laughs> what's the print? Snowstorm. Nobody, see here, and I got you laughing, so you need to be wary. See, the thing is, when it's a common vessel, the attention is not on the vessel, it's on the content. Because here's what you'd say. What kind of tea is this? That's the best tea I've ever tasted. Where can I get some of that? How can I find that? What blend? You understand what I'm telling you? When the vessel is nothing special, the contents get all the glory. And that's why God put his treasure in earth and vessels. Because he will not share his glory with a man. I thank, listen, I thank God for your church. I thank God for the talent. But when that crack addict walks in, he don't care how pretty the building is. He don't care if the music's on key. He needs a taste of the contents to set him free. It's not about the vessel. It's about the contents. Oh, help me. 
It's all about Jesus. It's about the Holy Ghost setting people free. It's not about our name. It's not about our notoriety. It's not about our fame. There's only one name in this house that gets the glory, and it's the name of Jesus. The point of a simple vessel is that the focus is not on the vessel, it's on the contents. That's why I would have you note today that God did not place his treasure in vessels of gold so that people would ooh and awe about the vessel. He put it in vessels of earth so that he would watch, watch. See, I never met y'all before. I spent. There just might be a hillbilly or two in the house. I could be wrong, but I'm not. So I, I didn't know you. I, I think there's only maybe one couple people in this house I'd ever met before I got here. But I know you. I do. I know exactly who you are. Because you are described to me in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 1.26 for ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Why? That no flesh should glory in his presence. I, I, I'm going to be nice, I think. My wife's not here and that's a struggle, but I'm going to try to be nice. But you are not a gift to God's kingdom. God's kingdom was a gift to you. When we start thinking that we brought so much to the table, that is misguided thinking. I was broken, damaged, wounded, empty, hollow, lonely, and on my way to hell. And Jesus said, I know you're not much, but I'd like to put my treasure in you. Be because when I turn your life around, everybody's going to know you didn't do it. All the glory is going to come to me. This matter of serving God, it's not about me. My opinion doesn't matter. My way doesn't matter. My ideas don't matter. My pleasure doesn't matter. It's all about him. It's all about him. We're even a little misguided when we talk about There used to be a song years ago, Brooklyn Tabernacle sang a million years ago. And they sang this song, he did it all for me. On Calvary, I know what we mean, but I can make a pretty good case that Calvary wasn't even about us. To prove it to you, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, that he might present it unto himself a glorious church. He bought the church because he wanted a church. I know that's uncomfortable because we like to think, oh, it was all about me. It wasn't. It was about Christ wanting companionship. And so he redeemed a church. Now, thank God, he looked at you and said, I want you in the church. But my dear brothers and sisters, it's not about me. It's not about me. It is all about him. And what pleases him and what puts a smile on his face. It's not about the vessel. It's about the treasure. My friends, he placed this in a vessel, not a vault, because he never intended for us to keep this treasure. It was meant to be poured out and then replenished day by day. What good is a vault if no one can get to the treasure? When we were first married, my wife worked at the bank. As close as we got to money. I told him Friday night, some of y'all, you remember your first married? You didn't even know how broke you were. I remember those days. It scared me now to think about it. But we were young and in love and broke. My wife worked at a bank. And she was a receptionist. She became a teller, and then she became the teller supervisor. As teller supervisor, it was her job to lock the vault at night. 
She had to physically shut the door and set this timer on it. I know what these guys are thinking. Why didn't a computer do it? <laughs> no computers. <laughs> the look on their face. He's older than computers. Yes, I am. Almost older than dirt. So she had this little keypad. She had to lock it. She pushed it shut one night and made a typo. And instead of locking it for like 10 hours, she locked it for 20. They got to work the next day. Can't get in the vault. All their cash drawers are in the vault. Can't get to anything. All the safe deposit boxes. I told her, I said, baby, there's got to be a way to open that door. She said, no, you can't open it. I said, oh, come on. The manufacturer has to have some override code or something to open the door. She said, Scott, you can't open the door. I said, well, of course you can. I mean, you got it. What about an emergency? She said, there's air in there. There's water in there. Somebody's trapped. They may get hungry, but they're going to be okay. I said, what if somebody has a heart attack? She said, we'll know where to find them. <laughs> she said, you, you can't open the door. They had a man come in that morning. He and his wife were flying to Paris that day for their anniversary. He wanted his passport out of his safe deposit box. He weren't terribly happy. When he found out he couldn't get to it, and they were going to miss their flight and all that. And do you know that he was not satisfied by them saying to him, hey, it's safe. It's right where you left it. It did him no good if it was kept safe, but was inaccessible. Tell you another story. Story time with Uncle Scotty. Just stay here. Our church, when we built our new building, we were pretty strapped for cash. We had fundraiser we would do three times, two times a year, varied, called a truckload sale. Now, if you're not familiar with the concept, here's how it works. Walmart will take your stuff back for almost any reason. You take something back to Walmart, they got a very generous return policy. You decide you didn't like it. You decide it was broken. You, in fact, that people use it one time and bring it back for no reason except they don't need it anymore. They take it back. Now, some of this stuff they can put back on the shelf and sell, it, and sell it, but a lot of stuff they can't. So they wholesale this out, wholesalers, and then you can buy from that guy a truckload of goods that have been returned to Walmart for a discounted price. And then you can sell it to the public for half of retail. So we would get this truckload of stuff, never knew what you're going to get. And we would dig through it and we'd pull out stuff that was broken, throw it away, fix stuff if we could, test everything, but set up this little miniature Walmart, the gym of our church. And we lovingly referred to it as the cheapo depot. <laughs> Folks come through and we, we made good money with it. It was, it was a blessing. It kept us, kept us going, helped help pay for our building. I was walking through there one day, we was getting set up and I saw a safe. A home safe, not a gun safe, a valuable safe. I got to reading on the side of that rascal. And it's good to like 1,800 degrees in case of a fire or something like that. It was good to 200 feet underwater in case St. Louis ever gets hit by a tsunami. It, it, it had holes in the bottom of it. You'd open it up and, and you go down in your basement. I don't know, y'all have basements here? Okay, some places don't, so basements and, and, you, and you go on the concrete and you mount bolts you set this down over the bolts and you bolt it down and 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 you, you know that way nobody can walk off with it well i'm thinking it was 200 bucks so it's half that that's a hundred dollars i'm paying 90 dollars a year for my safe deposit box i mentioned earlier i'm thinking well duh buy this thing install it tell them they can keep that put it in there in a little over a year i made my money back i'm a fiscal genius there was just one problem. The person that brought it back, brought it back locked and did not include the combination when they returned it. You're looking at the proud owner of a safe that has never been opened. That thing is sitting in my garage. I have no idea what's in it. You may be looking at the wealthiest man in the state of Virginia tonight. I don't know. That thing could have, that thing could have cash in it, it could have bearer bonds. It might have Google stock certificates. I don't know what's in there. I just know that whatever it is, even if it is wealth beyond compare, doesn't pay my mortgage because I can't get to it. 
Do you know that a safe company will not give you the combination just because you call and ask for it? Strange. I tried to explain it to them. They did not grasp the cheapo depot. They said, sir, we're not giving you the combination. How do we know that's yours? <laughs> he sits in my garage to this day. He's done come by St. Louis. I'll let you see it. I say, why have you kept it? Because God loves me. And I am convinced that one day at the church that I pastored, we're going to baptize a safe cracker. I believe. And when he comes up out of the water, just before Calvary has completely stripped him of his former life, I'm inviting him over for dinner. And I'm off him a percentage if you get that rascal open. <laughs> it, may, it may not, I don't know, it may not have anything, but if you hear I bought an island in the Bahamas, you'll know we baptized that guy, all right? All I'm telling you is that I don't care how much money's in there, if I can't get to it, it doesn't do me any there's a treasure in this church there's riches in this church but it doesn't do your neighbor any good if we keep it locked up behind doors and they can't get to it okay it's going to get ugly right now I don't care what color they are I don't care if they're educated I don't care if they've got money whosoever will whosoever will whosoever will whosoever will Now, this is where I'm going to stretch you. Transvestites need the gospel. Homosexuals need the gospel. Everybody all confused in this LGBTQRX whatever and needs the gospel. And we can't shut the door in their face and say, no, you don't belong here. I got news for you. I don't belong here. You don't belong here. But his grace has touched us. This treasure is in a vessel, not a vault. Every nationality, every tongue, every culture, every political party. Are you hearing me? They don't have to vote like me to worship with me. They don't have to look like me to worship with me. They don't have to think like me to worship with me. Whosoever will, whosoever will, whosoever will. Because the value of the contents are of no value if they're inside a vault and nobody can get to it. God didn't give us this treasure to keep it. He gave us this treasure to share it. Just like he told the 70 disciples when he sent them out two by two, freely you have received, freely give. You are not a vault to hoard his treasure. You are a vessel from which he is to be poured out. God intended every one of us to pour out the treasure into our world, into our community, into our neighbors, into a home Bible study. You got to pour it out in prison chapels. You got to pour it out in nursing homes. You got to pour it out in homeless shelters. You got to pour it out in Sunday school classes. You got to pour it out in a Christian school. You got to pour it out everywhere. Because he did not intend for these vessels to simply sit there and hold the treasure. He wanted it to touch others. You must realize that your treasure needs to be poured out into children, into young people, into college students. I'll just go on record. This church needs a presence on every college campus around here. You've got to pour it out. It needs to be poured out into the broken poured out into the addicts and recovery centers, poured out in prison chapels, poured out in every setting, poured out into global missions, poured out into North American missions. We gotta pour back into our church and we gotta pour back into our community. I'm gonna try to move along quickly here. Probably we'll skip a slide or two. Here's what I know, folks. Vessels, even common vessels, only pour out their treasure under two circumstances. That goofy cup couldn't have cost five cents. Well, it's made out of petroleum, so maybe it's five bucks. But it's not much. It's rather nondescript. It's not terribly pretty. It's just very ordinary. And yet, 
If left undisturbed, now there, there's some water in it. It's not full, but there's, there's a little water in it. It really is. If, if your pastor was ever so gracious as to submit this church to my preaching once again, if I was back here five years from now, and if we could ignore, if we could eliminate the process of evaporation, let's just pretend that doesn't exist, okay? As cheap as that cup is, if your pastor was so merciful to give me another shot and I came back in five years, that water would still be in that cup. In 20 years, that water would still be in that cup. In 50 years, that water would still be in that cup. In fact, that pulpit would probably rot away underneath it before that vessel would give up its contents if it is left undisturbed. We may not be all that in a bag of chips, and we're not. We're sinners saved by grace. But left undisturbed. We can sit on our church pew our entire life and never pour out the treasure that God wanted us to do. You could go to church every Sunday and every Wednesday and live godly, righteous lives and your next door neighbor go to hell. And that, my dear friends, is not the will of God. So it struck me as I began to ponder this, that water, the contents, only pour out. You only get the water out of that cup under two circumstances. It bows or it's broken. And I'm preaching to you today what God gave me that he's willing to break us to get this treasure out. I preached, I preached to somebody today that's gone through a season of brokenness. You buried a loved one during COVID. You've had a difficult time with your health. You've gone through a difficult circumstances. Let me explain to you why. Because God said if I could get some scars in them, that treasure will run out of their life and touch everybody around them. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? If you came up right now and started pouring water in that cup, you couldn't even get it to the back door before it started running out. Why? Because it's damaged. It's wounded. But God uses the scars to get the treasure out. And I preach to you today, do not resist the scars. Don't get angry because of what you've gone through. God is setting you up to be more effective than you've ever been before. When a church is wounded, the treasure flows out. When a person is wounded, the treasure flows out. Stand with me if you would all over this house today. such unbelievable potential in this place. I thank God for 300 people that's here today. But there's 3,000 out there that need to be here. I plead with you, don't get so comfortable in this opulence of this beautiful building and the great music. Don't get so comfortable that we just sit and hold our treasure while people around us wonder what's inside. While we become the safe like is in my garage. And your neighbor goes, man, there must be something good in there. But I don't know what it is. Why? Well, because the doors are closed. I plead with you. Put this treasure in vessels of steel so you'd be so strong you could never be broken. He put it in earthen vessels that are fragile and can be cracked. They can be wounded and broken by a harsh word, a, a, a dysfunctional family. And we resent that and we say, God, heal that. And God says, if I heal it, how's the treasure going to get out? And listen, listen. And he cares more 
about you being effective than your being comfortable. Lord, heal my pain. No. You think, I, you think I'm outside the Bible? Paul says, I've got this thorn in the flesh. Heal it, God. No. It's the Apostle Paul. I've laid hands on, on, on the dead. They've come back to life. Heal me. No. I've, 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 I've shaken off poisonous serpents and I've, 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 I've miracles. I, heal me. No. But my grace is sufficient for you. Because Paul, I can make you more effective by not healing you than I can by healing you. Now, I, I, I hurt for everybody that's hurting. And my compassion says, God, please heal everybody here. But God says, I want the lost to be saved more than I want the church to be comfortable. So if I have to be scarred, if I have to be broken, I want to bow. Would you close your eyes with me right now? If you were here Friday night, you know I like to preach and just hang in the lights and shout and holler and run. But I'm so constrained by the Holy Ghost today to preach to a church that has graduated past the little country church stage to a beautiful building, a great congregation, a music that's unrivaled about any place I've been. And herein lies the danger. You can just sit on the pew and if you're undisturbed, the treasure will never flow out of you. Close your eyes right now. He boshataye my ikotoro yabaha. Hundi amaya katoro yarayabobosto toro yabai. Ye masata rayi mo yo kotoro yiraboyo santi yarayamaki. Hmm, masaye mi kotoro maha. Diomo yi akatarandia masandro yamai kataha. Hmm, 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 hmm. God's speaking to people right now in this place. Hey, hey, God is speaking to people right now. There should be people that should already be running to this altar to respond. You need to bow. You need to be broken. Let your will be broken. Let your selfishness be broken. Let your self-centeredness be broken. Let your priorities be broken. Let everything about your schedule be broken. Let your time management be broken. This isn't just about teenagers. Come on, folks. I preach the best I know how. I need some folks to come up here and say, God, I've never taught a home Bible study, but I'm going to teach one because you got to pour this treasure out of me. I'm looking for somebody to say, God, I kind of figure there's a nursing home that I could go in and at least read scriptures to some of the citizens there. And God, I want to pour out. There's a prison chapel somewhere. You don't have to be a great preacher. It's just to go love people. How about somebody teach an Acts class to the chemically dependent? How about somebody that picks up a homeless man and brings him to church with you? Church, we can't keep this inside a vault. You are a vessel. I plead with you to bow or be broken, but God help us to get the treasure out of us. This altar is yours. I will not beg anybody to come, but I do encourage you to make some kind of response. Kneel where you are, come up here, sit, something. But there's gotta be a response from this church today. God sent me here by design for this moment to challenge you to reach beyond yourself, to get out of your comfort zone and begin to pour out a treasure. Begin to pour out a treasure. Begin to pour out a treasure. Your scars are not to hurt you. They're to make you effective. Lord God, I give them to you today. I give them to you. Come on, pray. I'm done. I'm done.